Welcome to the African World. I'm Wilma Red. On the program today, Thomas Lai, an African-born partner at Denton's international law firm. Our firm is somewhat distinctive because we have a large array of transactional lawyers, but we also have lawyers like myself who have more of an advisory practice. So a lot of my work involves advising governments, for example. Also on the program, Daniel Ohene Achikam, Ambassador of Ghana to the U.S. We have achieved the status of the lower middle income uh, economy, uh, which means that we have more or less um, jammed the hurdle. But we begin with Thomas Lai, a partner at Denton's, speaking to Kwame Clement about Denton's work in Africa and his practice in international civil procedure. For decades and decades now, major U.S. law firms have had little to no interest in Africa-related work. Well, this has changed, and one of the major law firms leading the way is Denton's, the international U.S.-based law firms that has a growing presence in Africa. And to talk about Denton's Africa practice, as well as the overall legal practice in Africa, we're pleased to have as our guest today, Thomas Laye. He's a partner here at Denton's, and before joining Denton's, he was the Assistant General Counsel at the International Monetary Fund, where he was responsible for the firm's legal relationships with all of his 187 member countries. He was born in Ghana, educated in the United States and the United Kingdom. It's our pleasure to have you on the program, Thomas. Thank you very much, Kwame. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Oh, we're happy to have you, Thomas. Uh, let's start off by having you um, talk to us briefly why the change when it comes to American law firms and Africa-related practice. Africa is the highest growing um, continent in, in, in the globe at the moment. We grow for around about 5.5%. And when you look at other places in the globe, frankly, they're still in stagnation post the financial crisis. And so when you have clients like the ones we do, and you have law firms that are chasing clients who want to grow, Africa is an obvious place for them to, to look for those growth sectors. Secondly, for ourselves in particular, we are very much aligned in the areas where the growth is being generated on the continent. So we focus on infrastructure, we focus on oil and gas, we focus on power, we focus on financial sector, and we focus also on mining and natural resources. And those are the main areas where the, the growth is being generated on the continent. And so for us, it's a no-brainer, and for our clients, it's a no-brainer. Africa needs to be a major priority in the years to come. In what countries, you know, what areas of the continent do you have your presence, Denton's? Are you present in? Our firm have been present in Cairo since 1964. So we, we, we've been there for you know, many decades. And in addition to our Cairo office, we have a number of associated firms in 19 countries across the continent. And we use that model in order to integrate our international expertise, which a lawyer like myself provides, but integrated with the local expertise, which frankly you need to work seamlessly together in order to be able to ob obtain appropriate advice working in the continent. In addition to that, we have frankly worked in every single country in the, in the continent. Um, so we, we consider we not only understand the general trends of, of legal and, and financial issues in the continent, but we also understand the specific requirements, the specific constraints, the specific opportunities that arise from country to country. Now, Denton's is the result of a merger of uh, uh, three major law firms, a Canadian law firm, a British law firm, and an American law firm uh, based in Chicago. Now, you call yourself polycentric. Absolutely. And what do you mean by polycentric? I suppose everyone has their own view about what polycentric means. Uh, what I like to say is that we are experts in solving polylemmas. People say, what's a polylemma? Well, I say a dilemma has, is a problem that has two components. I, I, I deal with problems that have multiple components. It's a polylemma. It, it can involve a legal component, a government relations component, a financial component, a political component, an economic component. These are the real-life problems that, that one has to solve when doing business in Africa. And, and, and so you, you just can't have a binary um, yes or no answer often into these questions. So I think that's something that our firm does extremely well. We're, we're very uh, well versed in dealing with polylemmas, looking at problems from all sides and in order to provide solutions that are practical and workable for our clients. The major firms still, you know, have um, a rather cautious approach to mm -hmm. Africa practice. Um, 
why is it uh, most firms still are not looking at the continent? What would you tell them about practice on the continent? Or would you prefer that they uh, keep Africa off the bidding track and leave it to you alone? Yes, I, I, I don't mind that they're behind the curve. Uh, we, we recognize we are very much in front of the curve. We intend to stay as market leaders. I think our experience as a firm is informed by the fact that we, we have benefited from those recent combinations that, that you, you, you mentioned. So we've had long-standing Africa um, practice experts in our London office and the Middle East office. And now that we've combined with a Canadian firm, we've got tremendous Africa mining experience coming from Canada. And our so-called Dentons Europe uh, part of the firm has got tremendous Francophone experience. So we're able as a firm to bring that already together. Now, that is much more daunting for an uh, international firm or a U.S. firm that hasn't had that track record of experience. So understandably, you see many firms are trying to, uh, to gain a foothold in Africa-related work, but they, they recognize that, if you like, the sunk costs they need to bear in order to get there are quite high for many firms. And so now you see, in my mind, a lot of intellectual understanding that firms need to move in that direction but not every firm has managed yet to figure out the strategy and managed yet to be able to implement a strategy to get them there. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you spoke about the growing um, positive economic news out of the county. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the fact, Thomas, that Africa is posting just about the highest economic growth rate in the world at the moment. Uh, what would you say explains this positive economic trend on the continent? That has attracted you. Well, I think th th this is time for Africa. Um, there are a number of factors, both endogenous, i.e. within the continent, and also um, uh, factors which are coming from outside the continent. So post the financial crisis, we saw a lot of contraction of the economies um, in so-called advanced eco economies in the US and Europe. Um, and so that gave also an opportunity for growth to be um, to be generated and to be leveraged in, uh, in other parts of the world, including the emerging markets. And so the, you, you saw an equalization, if you like, with the emerging markets growing faster and the advanced economies somewhat contracting. So that trend has helped Africa. The other factors that Africa has in its favor is, frankly, it was coming from a low base. And so when you're trying to grow at high, high le levels, coming from a low base is advantageous. We've got a tremendous amount of human resources that have not been used and they, they can be put into the economy. You also see a growing middle class in a number of the countries that's also generating consumer and growth as well. So that's also a factor that's coming into play. And of course, some of the internal factors are in our favor. Uh, improved governance, improved economic management. Those are all policy changes which many of African governments have been able to, to hold in the last few years that is now bearing fruit and is also providing some stability that would allow for further growth. So as I say, there are these external factors that are in our favor, as well as the internal factors, and they're coming together. And as I say, this is, this is Africa's time. So let's talk about the man Thomas Laryer. Like I said, you were born in Ghana, but educated in the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, how does a boy from Accra, Ghana, become a partner at a major U.S. law firm and get this far? By the grace of God, I will say I made it here. I was born in Ghana, as you say, but my family moved to London when I was young. So since age three and a half, I, I was educated in England. Um, and then I moved to the US in order to do the master's and a doctorate in law at the University of Pennsylvania. And essentially, my career has been with trying to sort of manage that triangulation between Africa, um, the UK and Europe, and the US. Those have been my three centers of interest. But I've always been interested in international law. So I, I remember when I, I left the UK to do a master's in the US and my, my friends and colleagues said, why, 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 why leave the, the UK? I had the job at the so-called best you know, UK law firm. They said, there's no need to go outside. I said, no, I'm interested in international legal practice. I want to learn from the US experience. And so I, I came here for a number of years and I went back and forth until I joined the International Monetary Fund, which again is, is a premier international institutions. So I wanted some broader international experience not just on the legal side, but on the policy side. So th th this has very much been my interest. And I left the IMF to join Denton's because I wanted then to focus on Africa. I knew that I had the global experience that I could use as a platform for working in Africa. And I, I knew I could come to a firm that was truly dedicated and committed to the Africa practice. Mm -hmm. So for me, this has been a number 20 years has now been coming together. 
And so you did um, your Doctor of Juridical Science, SJD, which is the equivalent of the doctorate degree in law. What drove you to do a doctorate in law? Yeah, well, I, I, I've always been different in that way. As I said, I, I didn't need to do it. I, I had a, a job and a career path which you know, seemed to be you know, high flying, but I, I was interested in learning more. I wanted to, uh, to, to learn more about international legal practice. So your doctoral thesis was in an international civil procedure. What is international civil procedure? Explain for our audience what okay. is international civil procedure. Are the court rules, um, the court rules that apply in litigation. Now, I, I did a doctorate that compared the European rules for jurisdiction, i.e., the rules for a court taking uh, a, a case, and the rules dealing with judgment recognition when there's a, a case that's already been adjudicated. It, um, how is it recognised in, in other courts? So, a, I did a doctorate that compared those rules with the rules in the U.S and seeing how one can create an international system out of those rules. So comparative international civil, yes, civil procedures. Exactly, okay. so comparing different systems and thinking through the best practices that can come out of comparing different systems. And I, I still use that intellectual skill today, even though I, I don't practice um, European law and US law. Typically, I'm mostly focused on Africa and international law. But the ability to look at a problem and to compare the legal solutions and to compare the underlying drivers for that law and to be able to explain those underlying drivers for that law is, is a skill I use to today. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think it was very worthwhile. But, I, but many of my colleagues, when I had started doing, asked the same question you're asking me today. Obviously, it's paid off. Let's close where we began. Mm -hmm. We began by talking about the phenomenal growth rate on the continent. Um, where do you see the continent um, 10 years down the road? Where do you see um, uh, Africa-related legal practice, particularly by major? Good questions. Where do I see the continent? I think the gro growth trajectory will continue. Now, of course, when I say the continent, there's tremendous diversity in Africa. So there are some countries that we are, if you like, more bullish on than others, where we see particularly high growth um, coming, coming about. Our clients are very interested in Nigeria. They're very interested in Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda, the East Africa region, if you like, because they're integrating into more of a single market. Um, tremendous interest in Ghana, where, where I'm from as well. South Africa is a place where we are also very much focused on, but not particularly because of the high growth there, but they, they still get 40% of the capital flows of sub-Saharan Africa. And so if you're, if you're involved in financial flows, you really have to still be focused on South Africa, even though itself it is unlikely to grow at the same rate as many of the other African countries. North Africa, Morocco for us is a particular interest as well. So the reason why I articulate this way is not to give the sense that Africa is one place. It's you know, multiple countries, multiple markets within those places. And so the, the average will still be high, but there's some places that will be better than others. In terms of international law firms, I predict that there will be more firms who will be following our lead. And even with regard to ourselves, what I would imagine in the medium term, the next three years and beyond, many more firms will have offices on the ground um, because our clients are driving us in that direction, that they just don't want U.S. law advice and the Ghana law advice separately. They want the two to be integrated together. So it's important to be able to provide the so-called international expertise, but also very well connected with the local knowledge and local expertise as well. And that's something which I think will drive more and more international firms to have Africa-centered offices. So that, that's my prediction of, of some of, of the growth on the continent and also in terms of law firm movement. Where do you see Dentons in all of that? In that mix? We see Dentons at the very top. Uh, <laughs> you, you won't be surprised to hear that. You know, we, we, we've been thinking through this for a long time. We're, we're determined, as I say, to keep on investing in, in the continent. Um, you know, I, I've, I've joined, we've got new partners joining us who are very focused on Africa. We're very focused on investing in, in bringing forth the, the word about Africa. We, we're sponsoring events which are not necessarily bringing fruit for us now, but are allowing our clients to understand we're helping educate clients and others about Africa. And so we think that will, will bear fruit for us um, today and also in the future. And recently at the Corporate Council on Africa, said ninth biannual summit in Chicago, Denton said, uh, was a major sponsor of that event. Absolutely, we were both a sponsor of that, but also a sponsor of a, a select um, CEO roundtable, 
which was a, a very powerful event. I, I use that word, you know, intentionally, a very powerful event that brought together leading CEOs from the African continent with leading C-suite professionals from the U.S. and international firms. You put them together in one room and you, you really engage them in some of the issues that are driving um, you know, the, the growth and the potential in the continent. So we're, we're very committed to, to making sure that we dedicate resources and time and effort in those ventures. So in one way, you're bullish on the continent. We are very bullish on Africa. Thank you very much. Thomas Laie, a lawyer here at the international law firm Dentons, that's doing work in Africa. He's been our guest on the program today. He previously served as Assistant General Counsel at the International Monetary Fund. And today we've been talking about the growing interest of U.S. law firms in Africa and what Dentons is doing on the continent. It's been our pleasure having you on the program, Thomas. We we'll look forward to having you again sometime soon. Thank you very much indeed. This is The African World. When we come back, Kwame Clement speaks with the ambassador of Ghana to the U.S., His Excellency Daniel Ohini Achikom. Welcome back to the African world. Over to Kwame Clement and the ambassador of Ghana to the U.S., his Excellency Daniel Oheni Ajikom, Ambassador of Ghana to the United States. He's a veteran of the Ghanaian Foreign and Diplomatic Service, which he joined in 1965, serving in uh, Israel and then Denmark, among other places. He's also a veteran of the ruling National Democratic Congress of Ghana, serving at one time as his pointsman in the Ashanti region of Ghana. He's been ambassador to the United States since 2009, and it's our pleasure to have you back on the program, Mr. Ambassador. It's my pleasure as well. Let's look at the Ghanaian economy generally. The last time we were here, we talked about the good news, you know, the relatively high rate of growth. Um, I think it was 2010 or so we spoke to you last. How will you describe the economy today? How is it performing? What are its challenges and problems? Uh, since we last had this opportunity to discuss uh, Ghana, um, we have been... Um, we have achieved the status of the lower middle income uh, economy, uh, which means that we have more or less um, jammed the hurdle and are no longer uh, considered as um, one of the um, poor uh, or poorer countries uh, in our part of the world. Um, certainly, um, Ghana has uh, made tremendous strides in um, in all uh, aspects of our economic development. We all acknowledge the fact that education is important. And so we have um, placed deserved emphasis on providing educational access uh, to our children, um, especially to train our girls and boys in the area of mathematics, science, and technology. Mm. But I think one area that is particularly important for us is transportation, roads, the construction of roads and highways to facilitate the movement of goods and services across our borders. How are you faring? Well, I think we are doing very well. Um, uh, many roads are opening up our rural communities. One major road which has been completed is the Bush Highway in Accra. That has uh, contributed tremendously to facilitate the movement of goods and services uh, between the sub-region. Yeah, we need road links even between the rest of, um, you know, the countries of ECOWAS. Right? Absolutely. It's our expectation that there will be a regional approach to the development of, of our road network. There are other areas that we have to work together to improve on. Let's talk about Ghanaian politics a mm. little bit. Uh, well, for quite a while, in fact, Ghana has built a reputation as um, politically stable country in Africa. Uh, you had your elections recently. Um, the opposition challenged the result. Um, filed court suit. It took a while, but the court eventually ruled and uh, affirmed the result of the vote. Um, what does that say? Uh, I'd like you to comment on it broadly, but how does the handling of the challenge to the election result and the peaceful resolution, if you may, by the court and gracious acceptance mm. of the court's decision by the opposition, and what does it say about the maturation of Ghanaian democracy? The system worked. The fact that we went through this process, I believe, 
was a clear indication of our commitment to respecting the laws of the land. Disputes are bound to happen all over the world. It happened here in the United States. But it was resolved peacefully, amicably. We have demonstrated beyond any doubt that when we talk about Ghana as the beacon of democracy, this is it. But what I want to say is that it is important that after the court's decision, the people of Ghana accepted the ruling and became united again behind the government in order to work to promote, to focus on what is necessary, what is important, i.e., we must address the development challenges that we face as a country. And so for me, the decision by the courts and the acceptance by the parties was a strong indication that we have indeed matured. Let's talk a little bit about the economy again. Oil, you know, Ghana began exporting oil, what, two, three years ago? About three years ago. And um, what are the results? Uh, oftentimes, people look at oil as this panacea for their development yields. I'd like you to speak to that. Then I also know you set in place, Ghana, a, a program to ensure that money for the oil, from oil is there for future generations of Ghanaians. I want you to speak to that as well. There is the known adage that uh, finding oil could either be a curse or a blessing. Now, what we have done is recognizing this, we searched for and obtained good advice from both the best practices from Norway and the worst practices from elsewhere. <laughs> and so I believe that we framed a legislation that addresses the basic issues about how to manage oil resources so that um, it becomes a blessing rather than a curse. Now, what we've done is by legislation, deliberately, we have enacted a law to define the parameters. I believe that 70% goes into supporting our development efforts. Now, 30% is reserved, what we define as the heritage fund. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Let's close with uh, one final question, and that's about you. Um, you know, my question is, uh, how, is it, how have you fared? What is it like being in the heartland of the opposition and uh, working for, the, um, for your party and uh, what you've learned over the years uh, working your way through uh, the, yeah. the, the NDC and the Ghanaian politics? Yeah, well, no, Ghana without Ashanti is half full. With Ashanti, it's full. It's either half full or half empty, but with Ashanti, it is full. And for me, even though my ruling party is in the minority, to confirm what I've said, that Ashanti is a very key political region. If any party which seeks power doesn't obtain a certain minimum percentage of votes from Ashanti, forget it. Now, what I mean is that it is true, admittedly, the opposition is the dominant party in Ashanti. The MPP. The MPP, opposition, MPP. But the NDC has its strengths. And for the past six elections, we have achieved a large measure of success in terms of the percentage that we needed to ensure that we won an election. You mean the percentage of the vote? From Ashanti. From... Ah, okay. Yes. Okay. 92, it was 33%. Mm. It came down a little in 96 to about 32.8 or thereabouts. Um, when we lost in 2000, it meant that we fell below the minimum percentage that we could have won, and that was below 25%. 2000, 
when uh, John Kufour was president. That's when we, it happened in 2004. In 2009, 8, 9, we went up again to about 30% approximately. And so the point I'm making is that 30% may not be much. But in terms of its contribution to the national effort, it is significant. Mm -hmm. Without Ashanti support, it is difficult to win an election in Ghana. Indeed, at the last election, 2012, Ashanti was the third largest contributor mm -hmm. to the success of the NDC. Coming from the Volta region. The region. Accra, Accra was number one, Volta was number two, Ashanti was number three. So the point is that Yes, um, my experience in Ashanti, it's been difficult, I must be honest. It's been challenging, but sometimes very exciting, you know, when you engage. Daniel was in the lion's den, you know. Your name yes, actually my, survived the exactly. lion's den. <laughs> so I survived as well uh, in the lion's den, as, as you put it. But the point really is that you need, Ashanti is such an important region. I'm not saying it because I'm not Ashanti. Mm -hmm. Historically, yeah. um, it's been a very important region. Led the fight against British colonialism. Against British colonialism and so on until we were subdued around the turn of the 20th century. Um, economically, Ashanti led the push for developing the cocoa industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's shifted from Ashanti to other parts of the, of the country, to Western region. But Ashanti was the leading cocoa producer, was the leading gold cool. producer, was the leading timber producer. And so putting all these resources together ensured that Ashanti was such a key region in terms of our politics, I've explained, in terms of economic development and all that. Uh, beyond that, we have a system of a traditional rule that is also unique, that we have a king, Otunfo, mm -hmm. who provides a united leadership for all Ashantis. And that makes a difference. And that's what propelled us to become such an important region within the, the nation, within the state. Um, and so I would, I would just sum up and say that, well, I, I was somehow uh, privileged uh, to serve as the chairman of the party for a while. I've always been privileged to serve my country in several other capacities as an Ashanti together with my other colleagues. And I'm now privileged to be here as the representative of, of our government uh, as an Ashanti. Um, and I'm proud that um, with the support of my community, of my family, my relatives, have been able to make a modest contribution to the advancement and the progress of the people of Ghana. Daniel Oheni Ajikom, Ambassador of Ghana to the United States, our guest on the African world today. It's once again been a great, great pleasure, Mr. Ambassador, to sit and chat with you. Thanks for giving us the time. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to at least talk about our continent and our region. I appreciate this very much, and I'm looking forward to future conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Until next Bye. time on The African World, which brings Africa to the world, I'm Wilma Red.